Bibles, turn to the book of, well, I don't need your book right now, but we'll, we'll do something in a minute. All right? All right. Welcome to BBI. This is uh, uh, Church History, uh, Session 2, Lesson 1. And we want to welcome you tonight. I've got some that's missing, and uh, they'll be back next week. So uh, pray for them and pray God will touch them tonight. Appreciate them uh, letting me know where they were at and what's going on in their life. So uh, pray for them. Now, let me, let me begin by doing a little fishing, all right? How many have a favorite Bible? You got a favorite Bible? Now, I got a lot of Bibles, but I've got one favorite, okay? And I carry it. It's right here. And I try to carry it everywhere I go. Uh, I've got one in my truck. It's, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, my favorite, but it, it works. But I like to carry my favorite whenever I can. I don't take it to work because sometimes my hands get dirty and sometimes I, I'm sweaty and, uh, so, uh, I, I use another Bible for that. Uh, how many have it on your phone? How many have it on CD? Well, how many have it on an iPad? How many have it on a computer? Boy, the Word of God is readily available, isn't it? All right. Now, I want you to take your Bible for just a minute. I want you to close it. And I want you to put it on the chair beside you and push it up under the table where you can't see it. Now think about this. Your Bible's gone. Okay? You don't have a Bible on your phone. You don't have a favorite Bible. You don't have a family Bible. You don't have the Bible on CD. You don't have the Bible on an iPad or computer. You just don't have a Bible. What would you do? You know, think about that for a moment. We're talking about a time in the Middle Ages. It ain't clicking. We're froze. Let's move on. My IT man's are taking care of that. The Bible in the Middle Ages. I want you to think about that. If you had one back during the Middle Ages, guess what? you probably couldn't read it because it wouldn't be in your own language if you could read. And, and during the Middle Ages from 1100 to 1500 AD, uh, we could say that Rome was doing everything in its power uh, to keep the Bible away from the common people. You and I are common people. Okay? So there would be uh, no reading of the Word of God. There would be no studying upon our own. There would be no uh, cause to, uh, to read. And uh, the only way that uh, you could hear the Bible was to hear it read by someone and you'd have to depend upon their interpretation in order for you to have any understanding. I don't want to depend on somebody else. When I preach the Bible, I, I like to hear the pages turn of those who are in the congregation. I want them to follow me. I want them to follow the outline. I want them to follow the Scriptures. I want them to read the Scriptures that they can have understanding for themselves to see if I'm not preaching the truth. Now think about that. The, the, the believers who were never a part of the Roman church were doing everything in their power to, dis, to distribute Bibles. And they were catching the devil for it. Amen? And Rome uh, began a war against the Bible. And Rome forbade the people uh, to possess the Scriptures. Think about that. They had the military to back it up. And uh, the Catholic Church claims that it did not completely forbid the people 
uh, to have a Bible, but that's that's just a blatant lie. History shows that, and uh, they they uh, they place restrictions upon the Bible. The Catholic Church claims that it did not completely forbid the people to have the Bible, and then on top of that, they uh, they place restrictions on the Bible. And they were very stern. One of the restrictions uh, on using the Bible or reading the Bible uh, was that the Bible could be read, uh, could only only could be read uh, that with the that permission of of the Catholic bishop. The bishops had a lot of power back in those days. Another restriction. Come on up there. Another restriction was no one was to read the Bible in their own tongue. Think about that. And what this meant was that most people were forbidden to read the Bible uh, at all. And and since only uh, the most educated could read uh, Latin, that's what the Bible was written in. There was no English Bible. There was no French, no German, no Swedish, none. It was all written in Latin. And uh, many people didn't know how to read at all. Then we come to a guy by the name of Pope Innocent III. He issued a statement. He says that they shall be seized for trial and penalties who engage in the translation of the sacred volumes or who hold a, a secret uh, meetings or assume the office of preaching without an authority uh, of their superiors. They, they they didn't want anybody to have the Bible. And, uh, you know, they just, just kept on and on. Uh, think about that. They had to ask permission to preach. You guys that are preachers here, what would you do? <laughs> Something to think about, isn't it? Uh, that was by the old law, the, the beast touching the holy mount was to be stoned to death on, or, or simple uneducated men were not to touch the Bible or venture to preach its doctrines. Think about that. What would they do with these old North Carolina mountain men? Amen. Then we come to the Council of Toulouse. This was in 1229. They forbid the laity, that's the people in the church, to possess or read any translation of the Bible. Uh, You know, only the Roman Catholic Church would authorize you to read, and uh, you you uh, you had books of daily psalms, you had hymns, and you had prayers. That's all you had. You didn't have a whole Bible. Uh, the council used these words: "We prohibit the permission of the books of the Old Testament to laymen, ex- except perhaps they might desire to uh, uh, psalter or some uh, brewery." Uh, for the divine service uh, or hours of the Blessed Virgin Mary for devotion, expressly forbidding their having uh, their other parts of the Bible translated into their into the uh, vulgar tongue. Boy, they uh, they just didn't want any translations of the books. And think about this. 2 Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we are to be, students of the Bible. Matter of fact, that's the verse we use here. And and these folks forbid people to have the Bible. They didn't want that. You could just mark that one out. You couldn't study you say, well, well, well what's a, 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 a synoid? Well, 
That's the next one. Uh, the sin oil of Paragona, okay? 1234 A.D. Uh, a synod historically is a council of a church, usually convened to decide an issue of doctrine, administration, or application. Now think about that. Under the synod, they ordered all vernacular versions to be brought to the bishop to be burned. What do you do if somebody come in and want to take all your Bibles and burn them? I believe there'd be a fight in my house. Amen. But yet, we see people who take their Bible and they'll throw it in the back window or the back seat of the car and they never pick it up till the next Sunday and the pages are curled up. That's one of my pet peeves. I'm not going to treat the Word of God that way. Matter of fact, my mama was so strict on the Word of God, if you laid anything on top of the Bible at your house or her house, uh, we didn't get whippings, we got whoopings. You got a whooping. Amen. That, that's how seriously she took it. Amen. And, and so uh, they ordered them to be burnt. And, you know, if somebody would take your Bible order it to be burnt, what would you do? And during the Middle Ages, bishops were extremely powerful. Uh, in fact, in, in the latter Middle Ages, kings were to take the orders from the bishops. You know, I used to watch some of those old uh, uh, movies on TV, on the, uh, that, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the channel. It was, uh, it was a Turner channel that, that had classics on it, old classics. And uh, you'd see those bishops in there giving the king's advice, and they had to do whatever uh, the bishop told them to do. They always went for advice. And, uh, of course, they'd say, long live the king, you know. Uh, uh, bishops uh, were considered above all the heads of state. And in the, every Roman Catholic church, there was a, a seat reserved for the bishop. And even in the kingdoms, the, where they ruled, where the kings ruled, the, there was a seat reserved. And above the bishops, was the archbishops who was head over all the bishops in, in the whole country. But that's what they live for, is to destroy the Word of God. Then you have the Fifth Lateran Council, 1513 to 1517 A.D. Uh, you know, they... Uh, the Lateran Council was a series of councils held uh, in the Lateran Palace, uh, a formal papal residence in Rome. No books were to be printed except those approved by the Roman Catholic Church. Think about that. They were in complete control. The Council of Trent is the next one, uh, had three sessions, December 13th, 1545, to December 4th, uh, 1563. And, uh, you know, Protestant heresies and defined church teachings in the areas of Scripture and, and tradition. They, they defined what people could do. They, they, they condemned, uh, you know, what they could do and what they could not do. And, uh, Trent, uh, then capital of the Prince uh, Bishopric uh, of Trent uh, in the Holy Roman Empire, now in modern Italy between uh, 1345 and uh, 1563, uh, they had a total of 25 sessions uh, for three periods. Uh, they were serious about what they did. In 1546, they placed the Bible on its list of prohibited books. You know what the best seller in the world still is today? The Bible. But in some countries it's banned. Amen. Forbidding anyone to read the Bible. And, uh, you know, if you read it, guess what? You had to have a license. 
It should be unlawful for anyone to print, to have printed any books dealing with the sacred doctrinal matters without the name of the author or the the, the future to sell them or even uh, have them in possession unless they have first been uh, examined and approved by uh, the ordinary. Now think about that. They had to have approval. Couldn't even possess them. Think about that. Couldn't print them. Unlawful for anyone to print or have printed any books dealing with sacred doctrine, uh, you know. And, and you had to have your name on it. Can I tell you something? See the name of the author there? Have you ever noticed the authorized King James Version? It's not copyrighted. Print as many as you want. Amen. Hallelujah. So, you know, uh, this was uh, an ordinary, was a, a superior similar to a bishop uh, in charge uh, of the diocese. And the diocese uh, in the territory of, or church is subject uh, to the jurisdiction uh, of the bishop. Had great power. I, I don't want that kind of power, to tell you the truth. The Bible's distribution uh, in 1041 A.D. in Beijing in China, they invented the movable type. Think about what that did. Amen. Blocks of wood had been used uh, by some dating back to the 9th century uh, A.D. But in 1440, a uh, German inventor, Gutenberg, uh, invented uh, a printing press process that would be used uh, until the late 20th century. And that's the way it was, was made. And even through the attempts of the Roman Catholic Church to keep the Bible out of the hands of the people, there were many translations which appeared during the Middle Ages. You want something to, to grow? Persecute it. Try to stop it. That's what happens to the church. Amen. And the term vernacular translation or vernacular Bible, uh, vernacular Bibles was a translation into the everyday language of, the, of, of people as... Uh, Dis distinguished from a literary dialect of their language or some other dialect or language of education or social prestige. That's what a vernacular Bible is. The Bible had been translated some 25 times in various languages before 1450. Think about that. That was due to the movable type. You say, well, why is that all necessary for me to know? Hey, we ought to be, we ought to be glad and we ought to be thankful for what we have in the Word of God today. I've probably got 15 Bibles around my house. Man. I keep one ahead of my bed in case I wake up at night and I need the Word of God. I say, preacher, you're crazy. No, I'm not. I keep a pen and pencil there so God gives me a thought I can write it down. Because you know what will happen? This old weak mind of mine will go to sleep and forget it. That's my flesh. We've got to be spiritually minded. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. You can open your Bibles now. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Okay? Think about that. Isaiah 55, verse 8. Something happened, Michael. There it is. Isaiah 55, verse 9. For as the heavens is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Verse uh, 10. For as the 
rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but wasteth, uh, watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Well, I'm glad that I have the Word of God. And guess what's going to happen? The Word of God is what gets the job done. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. I found out this about the Word of God in the last 39 years of being a Christian. It'll either do one or two things. It'll either draw you closer. If you're lost, it'll convict you and draw you closer and save you. Or if you're a Christian, it'll draw you closer. If you're a Christian not living where you need to be, it'll bring conviction to your heart and you'll, you'll want to get away from it. Amen. I'm glad for the Word of God. Think about this. First Peter 1.18 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse 20, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's not going to change. I believe I read this tonight, Matthew 24, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Amen. I'm glad for the word of God. But notice this, for all flesh is as a grass, all the glory of man is the flower of the grass, the grass withereth and the flower fadeth there. Uh, thereof and falleth away. Uh, all these men who think they're in control and have all this power, I'm going to tell you, they're going to pass away. But notice this. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Well, I'm glad the gospel pierced my heart one time. I'm glad I had someone who had a Bible uh, uh, who understood what it meant to, to tell other men. And we are to be broadcasting the seed, giving out the water, sharing the bread, and being alive. Amen. Now, here, here's a listing on several translations, uh, and uh, uh, there's the Spanish translation as early as the 12th century. Uh, the Bible appeared the Old Norse language in 1220. Uh, Wycliffe's English uh, New Testament arrived sometime around uh, 1380 A.D. Then uh, Wycliffe's Old English Testament, uh, English Old Testament, arrived sometime around 12 uh, or 1382 A.D. A translation of the whole Bible in French came in the 13th century. German's transla translations appeared in the 13th and 14th century. So you're not going to you're not going to snuff out the Word of God. The Bible was translated into many other languages. You have the Dutch, you have the Swedish, you have the Danish, you have the Arabic, you have the Italian, but you had them guards that wanted to destroy. The Word of God. You know, before Columbus reached the West Indies in 1492, there was at least 12 editions of the Bible in the German language. So God's Word was getting around the world. Now, the effort was to bring light to the multitudes who were in darkness. And in contrast, the Roman Catholic Church uh, and its attempts to stop 
and destroy the Word of God. That's what they wanted to do. They, they didn't want it. They wanted a guard around it. In some cases, the Roman church was able to destroy every copy of a translation. That's like wiping out somebody's genealogy. But can I tell you, the Word of God lives and abides forever. You're not going to destroy it. I, I believe there was a king in the Old Testament that took a pen knife and cut some and throw it in the fire. But you know what? The Word came right back. You're not going to, you're not going to stop it. And, and in most other cases, only one or two copies remain uh, of the various translations. Thank God their, their wicked plan had failed and they did not destroy the Word of God. Isn't it good to know that God loves us and God cares for us and God's provided a way through Calvary and we can learn of that in His Word? Our Bibles are to be the most precious thing we own. And you know, uh, and I, I'm just going to be transparent, just be honest with you. There was times in my early Christian life that, uh, you know, I, I didn't get up and spend time in the Word of God. I, I didn't study the Word of God. I didn't pray like I should. But boy, under the preaching of the Word of God, God began to convict my heart. God began to blister me. And things changed. And you know what? God's Word changed me. And that's what God's Word does. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of sunder, the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Acts 4.12 And we are to read it every day. We are to cherish it every day. We are to share it every day. And how many times do we bypass somebody and not share it? I had the opportunity to witness twice today and share the Word of God. And uh, uh, I won't do that. And, you know, we ought to carry tracks. Those little tracks with the Scripture on like Brother Shoemake gave out in church on Sunday. Uh, don't keep the seed in the barn. Is the seed yet in the barn? Just pass it out. And uh, one old boy thanked me. He said, thank you for sharing. You don't find that too often. Amen. God's Word is precious. And uh, next week, we'll be uh, again looking at some things uh, concerning church history. And uh, uh, WACF, I think we'll be studying a little bit and some others. Uh, we've already talked about the Dothmas, the uh, Novations, the Paulicians, and uh, that's just to mention a few. And uh, we'll be talking about John Wycliffe in the uh, uh, first complete Bible in the English language. And, uh, you know, what, what a, a great man of God that stood and uh, delivered the Bible and uh, uh, to the English-speaking people. Thank God for that. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for loving us. Thank you for our time together. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, through studying some history that we've learned and Lord, we can continue to see how precious our Bible is and what the Word of God should mean to us. And I pray that we'll take the Word of God. You said that we should hide it in our heart that we might not sin against you. God, what a precious book and what a, uh, a number of precious promises it gives us. And I pray that we'll take it, we'll use it to build our lives, to witness to others that they may know Christ and that they uh, might uh, trust Him as their Savior. Help us now as we leave here tonight. Bless uh, each home, each church, each individual. And God, meet every need of all those prayer requests we mentioned earlier tonight and that you get glory in that. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name.